Let's record now. Yep, we are live and welcome to the video, everybody. Um, I'm joined by the Don. How are you keeping? Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And I am. We we are both joined by two candidates for the National Party. That is Paul McWheeney and Paul Hanley. Uh, welcome to the stream, lads. Thanks for coming. Thanks for giving us your time. I'd say you're busy. How are you getting on? Paul, you 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 start. <laughs> Uh, it's going good, very good so far. Yeah, um, very very busy, but uh, yeah. so far so good. Yeah, I seen yeah, I seen you got a lot of flyers recently on a, on a Twitter post, so I'd say you're flat out. Yeah, um, it's amazing. It's a great opportunity to uh, get get out and meet the public and talk to people face to face and let let them know about the National Party because, as you know, a lot of people, normal people, haven't heard of the National Party out there. So it's great. We we don't get any coverage in the media, so. This is how we're going to do it face to face and with leaflets and just yeah, talk to normal people on the doorstep. Yeah, yeah. and what what would it be that attracted you to the party in the first place? Like just for people that don't know, obviously we know sort of it's the same. But what would have attracted you to the national party? Well, um, as I said before, uh, I just happened upon it uh, a video with Dustin Barrett talking to uh, Dave Cullen and. Before that, I didn't know they existed, and I was just like scratching my head, going, "What's happening in Ireland? Like, why is why is nobody talking out about all this stuff?" And then, like, came across, uh, I'd say Justin, and he's just talking so much sense, and it's like, finally, there's, there's, a, there's actually something happening here. There's a group of people, like-minded people, that want to do something about it. So, I pretty much joined up probably the next day, and yeah, went from there. Yeah. And Paul, uh, Paul Hanley, uh, uh, the same question, I suppose, um, I have to ask well, you as well. What attracted you to the party? Well, it was, um, I mentioned it before uh, on Gareth Murphy's stream that, like, uh, it was around about the time the, um, the eviction of the uh, farmers over in Strokestown. And uh, I, I saw James Reynolds's report from over there. Now, we were all, there was a few from the village here that we were all supposed to go over. And whatever happened, I couldn't make it that day. I can't remember exactly what. But um, there was a, a lot of people went over there. And, like, uh, the, story, the story really, had, you know, uh, about that, like, by all accounts, the rapid response unit was over there at the guard station, uh, ready to, I mean, if anything kicked off, they were, like, ready to go in. Um, that was the report that I got back anyway, and uh, like the people were pretty, um, you know, they, they were up in arms about it. And look, I mean, I know, I know uh, the story was like, I mean, that uh, I don't know the exact um, situation with the with the family over there, but I mean, for the bank to send down um, X, uh, was it UDA or some, you know, or, or UC, uh, members of the RUC down to like, I mean, uh, like uh, it could have been handled a whole lot better, put it like that, you know, and um, like there, there's always been a rebellious uh, element in Roscommon, you know, I mean, it, it stems back for years and years, like my own grandfather. Now he was in the volunteers and I've uh, told before about, I mean, it was it was only there um maybe about four weeks, a month ago, and I was sitting down in the room and I went back through this book. It was called, uh, they, they put the flag of flying and it's all about the Irish volunteers back from 1916 to, uh, 20, uh, sorry, to 1921, 22 kind of time, you know? And, um, like, and it was, it was, uh, well, I get back to, you know, about the national party. And I saw the video of James when he was over in Strokestown and the talk that he gave and all about the, land wars and you know i mean uh, you know the history involved in the irish people you know uh you know gaining ownership of their own country over all those years um like people the people want to you know the the mainstream media and that i mean they're embarrassed about it now there's some you know they don't want people to go back over the uh the history and to any of the Roscommon people that are watching this, I mean, get that. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very, it's not me, boys, but uh, it's a very interesting book. And I mean, to watch, to go through it and look at the faces uh, of the people that are in that book. And it's funny, like, I mean, I sent a picture, I took a picture of one of the people in the book uh, to some friends of mine. And it looks exactly like one of their lads. 
I mean, only he's back in the twenties. Like, it lo- I mean, he's a spit of him, you know. And I mean, this thing about that they're coming along. I mean, oh, what's Irish? What's mm-hmm. Irish? You know, they want they want to cut you off at the roots for that. They don't want you to have any roots or to think that, like, I mean, that you've got any attachment to your own country. That's what that whole thing about, like, I mean, what's Irish? We all know what Irish is. Yeah. I mean, last weekend, and I said it to a bunch of lads over in Roscommon there during the week, I was at, in the graveyard with my mother at my father's gravesite. And, I walk, you know, you walk back through the graveyard and you see, look at all those names. And my mother on the way back, she could tell me who this person was, what uh, townland they were on, uh, uh, you know, who they were related to. And it was the same with my grandmother as well. You could sit down with her. And she'd tell you, you'd, you'd mention a name of somebody inside in Longford. And she'd, say, and she'd sit back in the chair and she'd go, oh, yeah, they were related to whatever. And then, and then, and then oh, yeah, and they, they were a cousin. Of whatever, you know what I mean? And she'd go back through the whole area, the whole history of the people. And that, we've forgotten that. My father was fairly good at that as well. But, I mean, the present generations, we, you know, like, uh, you know, we, the, the further we go, the farther we go down the line. I mean, it seems that we're, the more we're forgetting yeah. of the history and the persecution our own our own people went through. Pure yeah. persecution. Like I, I said it to the guys over in Kiltiven the other night as well. Like uh, when I was um, younger, and one of the lads who used to work with us out in the farm, and uh, there was a hill uh, on the land, and I remember him pointing over to the hill to me, small little hillock, you know pointing over to the hill and he says to me oh that uh the story is that's a that's a famine grave over there and i was all oh, right I mean, i'd never you know you know you think about a famine grave you never think much of it and then i remember it was after that and it was over in the um famine history museum in strokestown and uh i remember walking by one of the displays on it and about back then it wasn't a widescreen tv or like i mean you know a wall or anything like that it was just a it was just a piece of crap tv with a video, VHS, and it was on a loop or whatever. And it just had pictures of, like, I mean, the bog over in Kildas. And Kildas suffered, uh, that townland, by all accounts, half the people had to leave it. They either died or they were uh, exported. I think there was, um, I can't remember exactly now, it's in another one of the history books there, but I think there could have been uh, a couple of thousand people lived in the townland and, uh, like it was, or sorry, the parish of Kilglass back back at the time of the famine, and then after the famine, there was maybe five, six hundred left on it, you know. But um, yeah. but then and back to the thing with the the, the, mm-hmm. the famine museum, and I remember there was this one display, and it it was they were going through the papers back in the day, back during the famine. So it was like between eighteen forty five and eighteen forty seven, you know. There were everybody thinks it was just one famine. It wasn't. It was a you know like I mean a few different years. Um, but this one thing always stuck out with me, and it was a report in the local paper that uh, I think it was something like 10 bodies were found in the ditch, half eaten by dogs. God. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then and th- this, is a, this is the kind of, you know, this is the thing that, like, I mean, you know, we're, we're not supposed to remember we're now. supposed that, to forget this. But I tell you, this is we're actually getting at something very important here. Like, this is, this is you got me thinking about it, because I've been thinking about this a lot. This whole revision of our identity, of our history, like this constant attack on on the past, taking history oh, yeah, out of yeah. the syllabus, murdering the Irish language. Like, this has been going on for a century, like mm. you know what I mean. And it's gotten it's gotten really bad, I think, since the uh, since the seventies, really, since the troubles. You know, the, yeah. the the lads down here took on this uh, subservient role to the British, and they essentially administered British foreign policy in Ireland. You know, by that time, and they they prolonged and they exacerbated it and the the troubles by doing that and. They uh, delegitimized real nationalism. They've made it a horrible thing. They've made it a curse word to give a shit about the yeah. future. And you're, and and you're, that, you know? Sorry for interrupting you there, John. But like, and uh, just after when they came out with this thing about commemorating the RIC, that just, I mean, that just like, I mean, I, I wasn't going to run at all, right? But that just said to me, like, I mean, oh, these lads, they're, they're, you know, they're just, you know, they're they're messing uh, with us. They're stomping, they're stomping all over the history of the country. Yeah. stomping all over and that's from somebody my the grandfather that i told you martin fallon that was in the north of Scotland, uh, volunteers his brother tom fallon he went to world war one he got injured came back to ireland he went back again to world war one fought in world war one again came back to ireland and joined the ric he was in the ric 
So he had one brother that was in the volunteers and another that was in the RIC. And that would have made interesting uh, Civil War. down at the breakfast table in that house. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, I would, uh, and then Tom, once he left the RIC after the uh, war independence and the Civil War, well, he left it after, I think, I think before the end of the war independence and then after the Civil War. And then he went down, or sorry, he went up to the Phoenix Park, I think. And he was one of the first men in there training the guards. Or the civil, I think it was the civil uh, police force or something it was back then. I can't remember the exact thing. But um, like that, that was him. And I, I would put money on it that he would, uh, Tom Fallon, he'd have come along and he'd just say, look, let sleeping dogs lie. Don't go back there. You know, yeah. mm -hmm. as an RIC man himself, I would put money on it. Now, uh, but he, even if you wanted to uh, commemorate the RIC, what it's did they do? Oh, I know, it's redeemable. But, what did they do? They went straight in. It's the year of the war independence. They went straight in and talked about the uh, commemoration for the RIC. Yeah. You know, nothing about, I mean, okay, well, we're going to have this, that, and the other for the war independence, you know, maybe, you know, certain uh, altercations or whatever, you know, and, uh, but like straight in, let's, you know, let's commemorate the RIC. Now, a lot of people have said to me, like, I mean, is this some sort of like, uh, um, how would you call it? false flag thing where they want to find out like i mean you know test in the water see like i mean what they can get away with this kind of thing you know I but like you do that before and they knew there was an election coming up i mean it's either the height of stupidity or like i mean there's something going on there i tell you i've, I've thought about that because yeah. i a lot i've heard that theory before like i've heard theories that it was about getting Sinn fein kind of support because they want to do a kind of a finna fall Sinn fein type of coalition or whatever i actually don't think it's that at all I think they've been at this a while, Paul. You see, this is the thing. Yeah. Like they were trying to do, they were always trying to get the poppy in to get the Irish people to, to wear the poppy. And yet there was absolutely no concessions from the other side. Like there was, there were, no one would ask the British to wear the lily or something. You know what I mean? Like there was, there's no, there's not, there's nothing equal about this. They've been at this a long time. Like Gareth Fitzgerald was legendary for going around like this, going oh. around pandering yeah. to the English the whole time. You know, sucking up the Thatcher and getting nothing back. You know what I mean? And so I think it's just an ingrained attitude of servitude that I, I just despise it, to be honest. I, oh, I, yeah, I have here. more respect for uh, foreigners yeah. than I do for these types of people. You know I, I, mean? thought like, was, no I thought it was... I thought it was... I thought it was Varadkar trying to make himself look bad and because it, it did because did you see there a few months ago Michal Martin said I think it's my turn to be Taoiseach now for a while he actually said that in an interview so I thought they were just going to do a power swap and like now he does look bad Varadkar does look bad after that saying that he'll commemorate them and Michal Martin of course said no he won't he's, he doesn't agree with it so now he looks good so there, it, it could be just a hoover up sort of fence sitters that are looking into nationalism or something like that we'll never know if it goes ahead it'll be the worst thing ever. I know people that went mad when they heard about that, and they're not even into nationalism. Just the fact that yeah. they heard about that, it, it reinvigorated them. They, they were energized to be opposed to this. It's one of the worst things I ever heard in my life. And there's nothing redeemable about that, the, about the Black and Tans. Maybe the RIC before that weren't too bad, but the Black and Tans, there's no reason they should be celebrated here. Oh, Absolutely yeah. none. Just to drive us mad at this, the reason. And the other one, um, I don't know, did you see Black 47, that movie? I haven't seen it. I don't think so. No. Watch, watch that movie now. I mean, that, I mean, mm -hmm. it's um, it's it, it, it's fiction, but it's based on um, you know they, they've taken you know like I mean, the, you know the setting of the famine times and what happened back then and all the rest of it. And there's a scene in it where um, uh, the I mean, it's actually the, the the landlord comes down and who's backing him up? It's the RIC. They've got their uniform on the whole lot, and they're the ones that put in the roof of the house and left the people out destitute afterwards. That was the RIC, yeah, you know? Yeah, and, of then. course, they had to go into it, and they wanted to earn a pound and all the rest of it, or a shilling for their families and all the rest of it, you know? And, like, I mean, there were good people in it as well, but at the same time, they were the, the enforcers of uh, British rule in yeah. Ireland. Yeah, it'd be like saying there was good, there was good people in Germany during the war. It'd be like saying the same thing. It, it, it's it's irrelevant to what happened, what actually the agenda was, which was to stop Irish people rising up. So yeah, I, I don't see why they should be commemorated at all. I was going to ask how are you how has your message been received on the door and how he how he has been received on the door like uh, from the National Party? Do many people know about the party existing and are they uh, um, are they open to to the message? Like I don't know how people couldn't be though if they understood the national idea and that. But how, how has things been so far for you, Paul, on the door? Yeah. Paul, um, or for you, Paul, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, because 
yeah, I don't mind whichever. Whichever. Well, for me, it's it's been uh, really positive um, so far. And just yeah. pe- people are happy that just there's an alternative. I think, and they just a lot of them aren't aware of us, but when they hear what we've got to say and ha- have read the leaflet, it's all there, basically what we're about, and uh, they're sort of they're definitely on the same page, and they're they're glad there's an alternative. You know, they're looking for yeah. something different, and the danger is. They're going to just think, oh, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael. They're despondent about that. And they'll think, they'll think Sinn Féin is an alternative, but we all know that they're not. They're just, they're like fake opposition at this stage. Hmm. So, yeah, um, definitely. What issues are they bringing up? Would be, is there cer- certain local issues that are big in that area? Or, or would many people be aware of the migration issues? Probably not, unless their town has been hit for a DP centre, I'd say. But Yeah, well, again, in Ruski, the direct provision centre, um, the way that again, the way that was handled, and oh, I've, that was awful. I said it a number of times. The rent crowd. <laughs> well, there yeah. was that end of it, all right. And I said it the other night to um, at, at the meeting in Kentivan to the uh, Sinn Fein representative that um, uh, the people who were behind that protest went up and down the village uh, into the pubs, pestering people to go to this protest. You know, and like I mean, when people didn't, you know, they just wanted, you know. Again, just to see what was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen because the hotel was in litigation at the time. Uh, there was a group of investors who put down a deposit. Uh, everybody thought that the hotel was going to be transferred over to the new investors. Um, and then in October of 2018, bang, there was an announcement that uh, it was going to be a direct provision. There was no uh, debate about it. This is what was going to happen, and that was it. You know? Yeah. And, um, like... And as I said, everybody was led to believe that it was going to be opened as a commercial enterprise and then bang. And uh, the Sinn Féin councillor, I forget his name from Leitrim, he came down to one of the protests. I mean, and look, I mean, at the end of the day, what was it? It was an RT came down for this. I mean, there must have been, I suppose there was 30, 40 people there, whatever, you know? And no then, one from like, Ruski. Well, there was a few locals, I mean, and to be honest with you, they would, you know, they, they would have been full of good intentions. I've no yeah. doubt about it, you know, but they did, you know, they wouldn't have been, you know, they wouldn't have had the full story because, and the ironic thing about it is the protesters were protesting that, like, I mean, they wanted an end to direct provision. And then when the, when the direct provision center didn't go ahead in Ruski, they were complaining that, like, I mean, that the far right had, like, I mean, won the day and this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Jesus, like, I mean, I never heard... Isn't it funny how these people are always local no matter where they go in the country? I always find this amazing. Like, I see these same faces propping up in Dublin at protests and now they're down in Ruski. What the hell are these people doing in Ruski? Just Maybe a one of them in a holiday home there. And then, and then there was one of the guys, he was a Turkish gentleman, um, something, Uladag, I forget yeah, his I know name. that guy. Mm. Yeah. And um, he was quoted in the Ruskaman people at the first protest. And this was what he said. He said, it is our job to remove Ireland's borders. Yeah, yeah. it is his job. Yeah, and um, I remember that quote. So yeah, next, it's probably, getting, it's probably getting well paid for. Yeah, he's he's More actually like married to a. These are the CEO. NGOs that there's like I mean five point five billion a year going into like. Yeah. Now a lot of that money, by all accounts, a lot of that money is actually spent on proper uh, supports and uh, you know for within the country, but mm-hmm. like. Uh, like the, the example was there, like I mean, up outside the Doyle for the um, for the uh, free free speech uh, protest, you know, and I mean yeah. their love love march or whatever you want to call it, and uh, you know, I think Garage Murphy pointed out that there was he counted up all the different uh, NGOs and everything that turned up, and he reckoned there was about twelve and a half million a year spent on them that was on their budget, mm. you know, unbelievable. unbelievable. Um, and I know you're saying some of the NGO stuff is legitimate, and it is, but I think um, the more people, and we all know this, the more people that bring in, then the more that's uh, complex, the NGO complex, I call it, has to grow. It has to grow to facilitate more people that are coming in. So it'll just keep growing and growing unless we get a handle on this. And I think all of these issues that, that they were talking about in the leaders' debate the other night, like uh, the homelessness and the housing and the crime that's gone up and the long waiting lists, they can all be tied back to um, mass immigration into Ireland. People just arriving here and send the word asylum and like uh, Charlie Flanagan says we will not leave any asylum seeker on the street but doesn't mention the Irish people um, 
So I think like that's something that people should enjoy about the National Party is that they're not afraid of this sacred cow of migration to, and they're not going to be led and said by these ENR pledges or stuff like that. This this is terrible. This is this is making the parties um not be able to speak freely before they actually roll out hate speech on the people. So once you sign that ENR pledge, you can't even speak about it mm. anywhere. So, so you know, like there's no people who represent our, our our opinions and what we see around us. Go ahead, Don. I was going to say, what would you guys like to see done with, with, about the NGOs? Would you like to see some kind of like rolling back of their power or like defunding? Because there's, there's like, I believe there's something like it says three or four billion. I can't, I haven't checked it before I came on now, but there's a couple of billion every year going to these people and, and including foreign aid as well. You know, and like they're talking about all these things, health crisis, housing crisis. And like, well, there's a couple of billion that's basically, from what I can see, most of it doesn't do a whole lot. Now, I'm sure some of it does go to the different kind of services or whatever, but like you could eat, you could you could have a kind of a, an inventory of all of this. There should, should be a proper investigation and an inventory taken of what these activities are actually doing. And anyone that's, in my opinion, that, that's involved in kind of anti-national activities to trying to undermine our, our cohesiveness, our identity, our culture, um, especially if they're out from, from outside the state, these organizations, because a lot of them are. You know, they're international uh, organizations. So what do you guys think we should do? I'll, I'll just throw it open to Paul McQueenie first. What do you guys think? Well, for me, um, it should be charity. It should be charity. It shouldn't be these big, massive NGOs um, basically taking our tax money uh, by force and then funneling it into NGOs. And there's probably people on huge salaries. Who knows what they're making? And then supposedly, supposedly doing good with it, but they claim to be doing good with it. But if you bring it, bring it back to um, charity and voluntary work, that's hmm. we, should, we should go back to that sort of system. You know what I mean? And people that have more money, tax them less, they have more money in their pockets to donate to charities and stuff like that. And they're more accountable for the money then as well if it's if it's fundraised like that rather than just getting whole uh, fistfuls of cash off the government every year you know what i mean i agree because these things they've become a massive industry in their own right you know and, and yeah. you see this internationally there's this huge like sector that grows every year and it's like it's got hundreds, hundreds of millions in it like over time you know hundreds of millions every year goes into it from governments and these things are effectively like uh they're international and they're they're kind of timeless like they last forever so they, these things outlast governments and this is what's yeah. going on a lot of these big international philanthropies like yeah, the, the Carnegie endowments that's been going since before the 20th century. That's been going since 1890 something, you know. And like, how many how many different staffs have come since then? What's that? What's the objectives of this thing? You know, what's it doing? And because you'll notice a lot of these things are they're promoting abortion, they're promoting all these kinds of uh, you know uh, getting the government to pay for contraceptives. And then of course you have the lobbying on top of that, of course, by the pharmaceuticals. Like, but but yeah, I, I agree. There has to be, in my opinion, there has to be some kind of rollback on these things. You know, oh, yeah. what do you think? absolutely. Well, you might remember um, there uh, is a two, three years ago where Amnesty International accepted was a two hundred and thirty-five thousand euro from George. So was it George Soros? Or yeah, it was. Yeah. I think it was one hundred and sixty-five, something like that. But a big, oh, yeah. big money, yeah. And uh, it's totally illegal. Yeah. And um, they just brushed it off, like you I mean, yeah. you know, uh, there was no. Uh, I think there might have been a little bit of uh, government pushback against, like, I mean, you know, you can't do that, you know? But they kept but, the money. They kept oh, the yeah. money. And the but thing was, RTE, every time someone would go on RTE from the pro-life side, they were asked repeatedly, what are your connections to America? Are you getting all your funding from America? Which American philanthropies are giving you money? And hmm. meanwhile, this massive, you know, organization internationally is pumping money in, and they didn't ask any of the gay marriage people where their money was coming from, because I can tell you money offshore as well. Yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's, I think it was John Waters said, like, I mean, uh, you know, like, uh, the gay marriage referendum was portrayed as, like, I mean, this huge, you know, like, I mean, we've been looking for this for, like, you know, <laughs> ever, I mean, the last 100 years or something. And he says it was it was 100 days, you know, about, you know, okay, maybe, maybe a few years. I mean, like, look, I mean, back in 2005, 2006, 10 years ago, sure, nobody was even talking about it. It was a joke, basically. The whole thing yeah. was a joke. Like, and I mean, as you get the abortion referendum, like, I mean, that thing was uh, so corrupt. Like, I mean, uh, adoption wasn't mentioned at all. You couldn't have mentioned adoption. Didn't come up. Um, and then um, and then there was no talk about the taxpayer funding it. Mm -hmm. Not a word about it. And, that, that, and then once the referendum was in, 
a couple of months later, oh, by the way, guys, we're paying for it. Yeah, well, and by the way, yeah, we told you it was for extreme cases. Actually, it's the most liberal one in Europe, and you know, yeah. tough shit, basically, like suck it up. And, and people buy this, like, and now they're going around. You have this N2 party set up basically as a kind of a you know, a, a pound shop Sinn Fein, and basically, yeah. their only difference is like that we're going to try and ask for pain relief, but they're not even going to roll back abortion. I mean, why does this party exist? You know, I, I, I just can't understand it, like, apart from it's a cynical way of rolling in the pro life kind of Catholic minded. Sinn Féin people and saying, well, you know, you have this option, you know? Yeah. And then, um, I'd say it must be six, maybe six months ago, I was driving along the Keys in Dublin, and um, I looked over anyway, and I saw some other protests coming up the other side of the Keys, and I was wondering, I wonder what the hell that is. And then later on that evening, I think it was on the news or something, like, I mean, it was to actually li liberalise uh, the abortion law, so like, I mean, you know, it wasn't, it was the 28 weeks now, yeah. Is it 28 weeks? Yeah. Up to 28 weeks? Yeah, I think it is. It can be done up to 28 yeah. weeks now. If, they want, if, they want if there's a mental health issue. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No. So, and yeah, they liberalise it. Internationally, they always use these things as a justification. Like, so you find that there'll be a lot of mental illness all of a sudden. Um, mm. oh, yeah. tends to happen. You know? and, and then, just, I mean, is it, is it New York State now? Did they bring that in where, like, I mean, it's like, I mean, right up to birth? Yeah. That is right. partial birth. infanticide, like, right. Yeah. yeah. That is murder, like, in fairness. Like, that's partial birth abortion. Like, how can that not be anything else, apart from pro-life or anything else? Where and, and another thing about when we had that uh, referendum here, there was no middle ground. There was nobody saying, like, that, uh, yeah, in certain cases, maybe it should be permissible if it's incest or something like that. But it was just either you're for it or you're against it. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're for it, you, if you're for it, you're... Um, you're not giving women their choice, and if you're against it, like you're a you're a murderer, and that was the two options. There was no middle, so it was it was done very bad, and I I think it, it, I I don't agree with it. Of course, it's terrible, but yeah, I it, obviously it won't be a thing in this election, but still, it'll it'll be always like it's always going to be. No one's ever going to be happy while that's here in this country, and that's just it. I think Paul, you made a great point about the charities volunteering. That's how charities used to always work was volunteering. Yeah. That's what charity actually means is you're giving your time voluntarily. Like, and now we see like the. CEOs of some of these charities are earning hundreds of thousands. So it has completely turned into its own monster of a thing now. And I think it does need to be scaled back. Maybe the most anti-Irish ones first um, that are doing nothing for the Irish people, scale them ones back first. And that might well, make the other ones sort of tighten up then as well. You know? Scale them back, just get rid of them altogether. That's it. Yeah. Not all of them, yeah, but the so anti-Irish ones, they've got to go. They do. They're, they're, they're the most dangerous thing in the country at the moment, I would, I would yeah. say, uh, definitely. But then, um, like, because you look at, like, uh, Trocra, you know, like, I mean, a Catholic organization, and uh, they're over with, like, I mean, the Antifa guys and all these guys outside the Doyle protested about freedom of speech. Great you know, like, yeah. um, you know if, those, if those hate speech laws comes in, come in now, I mean, you know, any chance we have a debate at the moment, I mean, between between the people on the left and the right. I mean, the, this is what's happened now. Nobody's talking to anybody. It's just like you know, like uh, oh yeah, you guys over there. Oh, you're fascists. We're not talking to you. And like, I mean, then the other guys. I mean, well, you're communists. We're not talking to you. You know, like I mean, there's just no debate now. You know, and no talk about uh, you. And you can't talk about mass migration. Uh, you know, like, I mean, uh, what's the name of the guy? Um, the French author. He uh, had that. Um, Welbeck. It could, no, no, just no, recently. The other guy recently now. He's, oh, uh, he's got three months. Grand Torino's he's got I know three, who you're talking about. He's in jail, isn't he, or something? Yeah, he got three months in jail for just saying that, like, I mean, that the um, that the migration towards Europe now is an invasion. By using that word invasion, he's got three months in prison. In uh, uh, you know, um, it, it's just like I mean, I, I think I it's uh, daughter of Albion. She mentioned it on her stream. She went through it. And, uh, like, I mean, th th this is where, like, freedom dies and tyranny, like, uh, comes through the door. Like, I mean, the fact that we're all even all here, like, I mean, you think about five years ago, uh, how, you know, how different things were. And, like, I mean, you know, I mean, personally, I never even thought about this stuff. Yeah. You know, never yeah. crossed my mind. I was just daily do me daily thing whatever just trying to get along. you never thought you would have to come out and defend like the ability to even talk about a certain issue you just, like because yeah. and what gets me about these people is that they're so like 
into this pretending that they're these big brave people challenging all we're challenging you know traditional consensuses and breaking barriers all they love all this rhetoric like and they're complete cowards they're they're incapable of defending their own positions in the public square you know like that they are censors they're cowards they're uneducated they don't even want to like they, we're, i'm at least interested in finding out what they even think about these things yeah. they have no interest in even listening to any argument it doesn't matter what what you reference it doesn't matter what you bring up they don't want to know you know it's just it's, it's a complete we're, we're actually we're actually becoming a very puritanical society in many respects mm -hmm. i know that sounds ridiculous but bear with me for this like in terms of like there's kind of a, a, a religiosity to it all you know they're really oh, like, we're the heretics yeah we are heretics essentially yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and, and and they're doing a lot of things i've noticed uh taking down posters and sabotaging some of your great work and all the time and effort that you're putting in and the people that are helping you that's absolutely disgusting i've seen videos of that where a fellow with a red star and his shirt is painting over a poster of one of the candidates is but there much of that happening that but all like I, i've got, i've had uh, 60 posters taken down in uh, outside that lawn and down at Ballinasloe and um I think Paul's, I mean, I was actually going through the village earlier on. He's had three taken down in the village that I've seen. And um, I'll leave it back to Paul to tell his story. Yeah. Are they messing with you too, Paul? Paul they are, yeah. Yeah, obviously so, yeah. They're the same Paul, Telegraph Paul, you'll see. Um, it could have been three posters on beforehand. Mine probably the highest one up because I knew it was going to be an issue. And uh, lo and behold, two two ones on, on the bottom are still there and mine is gone, you know, so it's not the wind or anything, it's just uh, yeah. it's obvious what they're doing, And but look, we, we expected that we're not yeah. completely relying on posters alone, luckily um, and we've got we've got some in reserve too, we'll, 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 we'll be putting up in the next week, so we didn't put them all up in one go so, mm -hmm. you know we expected these low tactics from them Yeah, and, and like at the end of the day, I mean, the posters thing like, I mean, uh you know, the thing, the jig is up, boys. Like, I mean, the name is out there. People, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, we're going around leafleting anyway. Like, I mean, we can walk, we can still walk the streets. It's still free to walk the streets. Uh, the the postcards going through the door, you know? I mean, the, yeah. the posters at the end of the day, like, I mean, most people were giving out about them and, like, they don't want to see them up around the place anyway. That's why yeah. most centres of towns now, you don't see them in, or, in it because, like, I mean, it's you know uh it's, it's the old way as well isn't it yeah. it is like a lot of things are done online now years ago you were saying like you used to go around with your dad putting yeah. up uh, posters for fina foil my granddad yeah or your granddad yeah yeah we did yeah i remember that years ago in a van for mm. i think it was charlie hotty he was putting up at the time it was actually charlie hotty little did i know but uh, i was only a child that time about 10 years of age we used to do that, yeah. That's why it is the old way. Most people get their information out from the internet. And I know there's a, a section of society that are probably a little bit old that don't, but even those people, as you said, can be reached by putting leaflets in the doors. So the posters aren't to be an end all of everything, but it just lets us see what the other crowd are like, like the, the, the badness of them to do that. Like the, the party are trying to, they're trying to um, operate within this political system and you're doing everything right, doing everything proper. And like you've clarified the fact that people were saying a while ago, oh, they're anti-migration, they're going to deport everybody. That has been all clarified perfectly. So, you know, I don't know what the problem is. They're just nasty. There's very good people looking after a member of my family. And I mean, you know, they're the best in the world. And I, I would not fault them. And I wouldn't have anybody else say anything against them either. You know, that's the yeah. thing. You know, and what people don't talk about as well is like, I mean, that the services in this country, we're, we're saying they're under pressure now. They're under pressure because they haven't been managed properly. Mm. And, like, I mean, you can talk... And I, I said said it the other day, like, I mean, you know, it's it's not uh, the people coming, it's the numbers, and it's the... Uh, it's not who they are. It's, got to get to, it's the numbers, and it's the way it's being managed, and it's not being managed properly. And we'll all... The people... Uh, the non-Irish and the Irish will all be poorer for that. Of course. Yeah. You see the yeah. Irish fighting for 50-50 the other day for, um, yeah. in a protest. That, that's a They're not looking to get ahead. They're not looking uh, of anybody in the list. They're just looking to get on the list. 
Yeah, and that's when they're eighty percent of the population. Imagine what you'd be fighting for if you if we go down to sixty or fifty. You won't be fighting for fifty fifty then if, if we're fighting for fifty fifty where we're still eighty percent of the population. So I thought that looked bad. I, I felt sorry for those people. I, I think they should have been saying we we want eight out of every ten because that's what the census says we are. Uh, that would be according to affirmative action or whatever. But yeah, they're only asking for fifty, so that's very fair, and, and we're not yeah. even getting that. We're not. Yeah. Even getting that. At the end of the day, it's, it's all down to supply and demand. And I don't know, did you ever watch that uh, video on YouTube? It's called um, uh, Gumballs and Poverty by uh, Numbers USA. I think we've all watched that. It's very good. Um, what he's talking about is, I think there's 5 billion people on the planet that uh, live on less than $5 a day. And he brings out all the gumballs and he stacks them up and all the rest of it. And he takes out one gumball and he puts it in glass and he says, by taking that million people into the USA every year, we say we're making a difference toward poverty. Yeah. It's tokenism, yeah. isn't it? Like it's, it's the height of tokenism sure and just like oh, you know, yeah. indulgent, you know. And, and then he, br he brings out more gumballs and he said, births over deaths every year. There's 80 million more people on the planet living on less than $5 a day. And he said from, from that 5 billion, it's the most energetic, the most intelligent. They're the people that are able to get out. You know? And I mean, yeah. power to them. But the problem the problem there is that, like, I mean, it's the, the sickest, it's the weakest, it's the, uh, you know, the people that are struggling that are left. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think somebody brought the point up the back in, I think it was the, was the late 50s, early 60s, that the, um, the ancient order of Hibernians in America, like there was such a brain drain in Ireland that they actually said to the American uh, uh, immigration, or the American government, that, look, you're going to have to stop letting people in here. Otherwise, like, I mean, uh, Ireland, the brain drain, it's going to be left in the halfpenny place for decades. And isn't it true? Like, I mean, it has damaged the country. Like, you know, there are all kinds of ways of measuring this. Like, if you look at the, the political system alone, like, look at the, look at the, the corruption and the, mm. the, uh, like, the, think of all the people. I, I think of all the people I know that are abroad. You know, yeah. these are all working people. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, like it, it is. It's the productive people who want to leave. You know, and you yeah. have to really make a kind of a choice to stay. Because, like, I remember ten years ago, we were all being told to feck off. Basically, you know, mm. that's what it was. Like, you can you can stay here, but you're not going to have much to much to hope for. You know. And I remember, I remember they had a, they had meetings and everything. And people were in college, like they were encouraging people to leave the country. There's nothing here for you. And then during the same, just at, around that period, the immigration ramps up in 2011. It really ramps up in a big way. So you have to ask, like, like what is going on with this? Like, like what kind of an insane policy would that be? Because it's clearly not in, in design to help the Irish. You know, it's designed to help someone else or something else, but it's not designed to help the Irish. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing I, seems I, to be designed to help us. Yeah, go ahead. I was told that 10 years ago, and I, I actually did. I, I went to Australia 10 years ago. I came back, well, came back last year. But um, like that, just told, there's nothing here for you. you. You should go. Like, I remember working on a building site, and things were getting very, very quiet. And uh, an older lad there was like, why don't, why don't you young fellas just piss off, you know, and uh, leave whatever work there is for us, go off somewhere, go in America or Australia or somewhere, you know. And, and the idea that, was you'd come back. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was the attitude though. Like, just go. There's no, and then everybody. What do you do? Like, you just go with the flow. Then you go. Like, I never. It wasn't really an option to stay at the time for me. I thought, looking back, I probably should have. Or, well, you never like it worked out okay for me, obviously. But I don't know. <laughs> you know. That was the mentality of everyone of yeah. your generation. Was let's get out of here. There's nothing here yeah. for us. Uh, that, that I know. Exactly. I remember that time. Football yeah. teams were been lost in towns all over yeah. Ireland and stuff like that. It was mental, so it was. And, and then yeah. when you came back, did you notice, Paul, that the crime had changed in Ireland? There was way more of it. Because that's something I want to talk about a bit in this, if I can, for a second. That the crime in this country, and nobody's talking about it in the media. These stories are just brushed aside as if they're like as if it was always like this. But I, I've noticed in the past three years, especially, that certain crimes are becoming way more noticeable in the media the whole time. And we have judges that are given tiny sentences. Did, did anyone not say that to you? Or have you noticed that difference since when you came back from Australia? I have noticed it, yeah, and it's, it's like Sorry. it's more violent sort of a yeah. society at the moment as well, and uh, yeah, a lot of stuff going on, and you just shake your head at, you know what I mean? Yeah, gang wars, and yeah, 
stuff that we never heard of here before, certain types it's, of things. It's like the lads, um, what was it? there's some lad down in uh, Cork, wasn't he uh, chopped up? Yes. And his body thrown in a derelict house or something down there. And then we have this young fellow up in Dundalk. Now, I don't care. I mean, whatever, you know, he did or whatever. I, I don't know what he did, but like, I mean, you know. He was fairly that, young. I mean, 17 or something, wasn't he? Yeah. 17. I mean, my God. Uh, like, you'd never hear anything like that happening. You know I mean? You'd hear, well, and even then before that, uh, like, I mean, the last ba really bad one I heard, like, well, was the two lads that were up in Dundalk and they were out and uh, they were found burnt in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, two bodies were found burnt out in the car. And, uh, like, I don't know. The, it just seems that society has become coarser. Now, I mean, that, that that's, you know, that's across the board. Like, I mean, you know, it, it's, I'm not blaming, if anybody says, oh, you're blaming, my no, I'm not blaming migrants. No. No, but, but there, there is some things that stand out like huh? I, I went through the last uh, if you type in taxi taxis and rapes in Ireland well you'll, you'll find the last nine cases have been people who are not Irish They're, they all have either Islamic names or some other name from Nigeria or somewhere like that and there, these are all cases in the papers and I think there's one Irish lad in the past 14 years out of 10 cases nine of them are all foreign nationals and I'm, it's, i think it's interesting the way when the government talk about crime or like that they'll never link it the same with any of the other things back to the, the fact that the country has changed in demographics in a demographic way we're supposed to like we're nearly led to believe that irish people have become more violent and are just lashing out more or there's, there's we're committing no more crimes and that's just not true well, yeah they never link it to their own policies but they yeah, then link it. the other one like I did mention it to a person there a while ago, and with this mentality as well, like um, uh, you know about the rape gangs in uh, the Muslim rape gangs in the UK, yeah. and you know it's an undeniable fact it's it's happening over there. You know what I mean? And uh, there was a, a report there recently that the police would not uh, let out the information of who was per uh, perpetrating the rapes because they were afraid that the whole town would rebel. Yeah, you know? mm. and that's not like, good enough. But it, it came up in conversation there recently, and I mentioned, you know, like that, you know, uh, look at what's happening in the UK. Do we think that we're special over here? That you know, oh, sure, everybody likes the Irish. You know, I mean, where we get along with everyone. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, like I mean, I noticed a lot of this attitude. Yeah, like we're oh, we're different, like because they they yeah. think like that, like we're the good whites or something. Like we're we're kind of special that that all these people give a damn. They don't. They don't give a damn. Like you know what I mean. The but same things can happen here. It's the same. But the answer to that, I mean, to me bringing up the uh, the Muslim rape gangs in England and Sargon of Akkad does. I mean, he goes very uh, in depth into it. If you want to watch him, Akkad Daily. I mean, he brought up stuff there, a, a lot of detail about it. But uh, but their answer to me when I brought it up was, I mean, oh, should the church were the church were at that for years? Oh yeah, yeah this is the. So let's just uh, let them out too. So yeah, oh. so that, yeah. That, that the church weren't at that. Like, I mean, that's that that, that, whole, that that's that absolutely asinine to say that. Like, it's amazing. That's and, uh, that brainwashed. I, I can't remember who brought it up there recently, but by all accounts, um, uh, the statistics in America were something like uh, in, I think it was 40 years that the abuse of cases were coming up in America. I think there was 9,000 cases uh, in 40 years or something like that of priests abusing children in America. Um, there were something like 125,000 cases in 10 years mm. of people in the educational system. Not, not, not got to secular... Uh, educational system uh, in America uh, or abuse cases brought up against people uh, abusing children in, in the public uh, school system in America in 10 years 125,000 yeah. I've heard that before, it's, it's an example of like how the media can just create a particular narrative with very with, by limiting the information and, and kind of highlighting some facts and ignoring others, you know what I mean? Like the fact that they'll, like, yes, there were abusive priests, of course, of course, there was an institutional problem, but then they, they have this massive thing on our own doorstep here as well. And have, have you seen RT do a documentary about the about Rotherham or any of these towns? I mean, there's dozens of these towns all over the country in, in Britain, hundreds of thousands, industrial rape, and all these feminists are silent. And if you bring it up, if you talk about it, 
oh, you're, you're being racist. I mean, it's, it's, it's the greatest yeah. brainwashing I've ever seen. You know, these people. Yeah. Just don't know Sorry, but, yeah. They deal with. For interrupting you, but and then uh, Sargo mentions as well. Like, I mean, they come up with this uh, um, argument that, oh, well, they, they were going out with the guys, or like, I mean, they were in a romantic relationship with them, or something. Oh, right. But it's like crazy, anyway. Yeah. But like, yeah. uh, but <laughs> but they were actually getting these girls hooked on heroin, heroin, yeah, and drugs, and they were coming back to them for a fix. They were like, you know, I mean, this is what was happening, and then it, yeah. it wasn't just one or two guys either. It was like, you know, I think there was one of them with the, did they have a rape something or something underneath the, uh, underneath the kebab shop over there somewhere? Yeah. yeah there was a case, Charlene Downs was her name. I remember that case. That yeah. was a particularly horrible case. Like, and they did actually, they cut her up and they disposed of her body that way, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's just, uh, you see, and the, the ultimate thing is like, I think the statistics were like, um, 78% of these particular types of crime were committed by 3% of the population. Mm. And that's, I mean, that in any other, like you, you imagine, like, just put it, this, this is how you do a logical mm. test. You know, if that was white guys raping Muslim girls, mm. do you not think that would be the, the biggest scandal or priests? It was priests raping boys or something. It, it, like, would that not be the biggest scandal yeah. in the country's yeah. history? Of course it would. Yeah. But like, you know. it's, have, can they not see like, have they learned nothing about the past and that? Because say you, you take their argument, oh, look, that's, oh, the church was at that for years, whatever. But like back then, some people knew what was going on and they didn't speak out because exactly. back then it, was, it wasn't PC to talk about it. You know, you get, yeah. you know, you have to go against the, the book, the trend to go and talk about it, you know. And now we're not allowed to talk about what's going on in like diverse communities because, oh, it's not yeah. PC. And yeah, have, you, have yeah. they learned nothing? It's something that's how I've it happened. Like, yeah, like, like nothing has really changed in society in that way. Like, like the people now who stand at the top of society right now are defending rapists right now, just like they yeah. would have if they had been in power fifty years ago. Like, nothing has exactly. changed. Like, with all their rhetoric and their liberal bullshit, like all of it ultimately comes down to they just want the power and they'll justify anything to keep power. You know, and if that means you have to cover up industrial rape of a hundred thousand young ones in Britain, then you have to do it. You know, and that's their attitude, and they don't care. You know, like, and, and it makes you look at them. In such, like, it's made me look at like progressives and liberals this way. Like, like I, I find them just dehumanizing. You know that their attitudes are. It's just most of their activism is 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 self-aggrandizing, and it doesn't really address the problems. There's a, there's, a, there's a book I have. Um, it's written by this African girl, and she's a. Uh, I think she, I can't, she's from Kenya. I, can't, I think it is, and it's called Dead Aid. And it's just getting back to the aid thing again. Just to, another example of how progressives ruin a good idea of helping people. Like they dump all this aid into Africa and ultimately all it does is it destroys local business. They destroy the local agriculture and they, and we're, <laughs> we're, we're doing this. Like, and all these people, they, they prop up dictators, they prop up bad regimes and they take the change agents. Like you were saying, Paul, before they take the change agents that would improve society and they bring them to Europe on a ferry. And, mm. and then they, and they say, we're really good. We're really humanitarian. And all it is is a big ego trip. You know, mm. when you tr cut these people open, all you see is me, selfishness. You know, I, I look at these amnesty people and I see selfish people. Sorry, big mm. rant, but that's it, you know. Oh, well said. Yeah. Yeah. I'll drop something there. Yeah, that's the mm. truth. But um, what, I, was gonna, I was just saying, like, I, I, I would love to see a TD getting elected for the National Party who could highlight these things in the doll, who would say, who would point out, no, the media has not been honest there with this, with this particular case, and they're not given a description of the person, that the perpetrator, so other people can't um, try and avoid this if, if there's no description or anything. Like. And if we had a TD in there that was a, a National Party TD, they would be able to highlight this type of thing, and they would be able to write private, private members' bills, be able to do so much. So I think it's so important that... Um, we try and get the I, National I, I, Party I, I, get somebody elected. But I don't know what's happened to TDs inside in, uh, the Doyle in the last 10 years because yeah, you're right. like, you always remember like f at least Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and whoever else, maybe to a lesser extent, Sinn Féin and um, uh, they had a Republican leaning or, you know, like I mean, a nationalist leaning. I mean, you know, they actually uh, were, you know, like I mean, we always heard this one, like, I mean, they were punching above their weight over in the EU, you know, like, I mean, uh, you know, they were getting things done over there and all the rest of it. But just seems to me in the last little while since uh, Angela Merkel has um, opened the borders, like, it's just, you know, 
uh, you know, take orders. We were only we were only following orders. You know, but a lot, a lot of John Waters talks about this, this idea, like of the, mm-hmm. like the, the caliber of. That would be an excuse. You know, <laughs> like, like the caliber of politician who is attracted to that. You know, and who wants to be that. Do mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like we all know these people in our own communities. Like they join politics, not to do anything proper like that, not to have any real principles or anything. They join it because well, I sure I always missionary father was in it, and you know yeah. for I said, I sure I I for it and, Simon you know, Harris is a thing. perfect example. Yeah. He joined you know, as a pro-life. I don't. Think he, pro- he pro-life, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think. I think some of them start out with the best will in the world. They do, you know. They're not. They're not bad people. But then I can see it. Like I mean, the system. Like even just getting involved here, and I, I think everybody should do it at least once in their life. Is run for the doyle, or just get into politics, or get into a campaign, or something, just to see what it's like, and like. Uh, and I have to say, I mean, when we all know it, like, I mean, the three week periods that we've been given to get ready for this thing is so cynical. Yeah. I mean, uh, and the fact that Leo Varadkar had wrong footed everybody and he was like, I mean, he led everybody to think that he was aiming for the end of April, beginning of May. And he was he was obviously talking to Michal Martin. I mean, you know, for sure. And I mean, if Mary Lou wasn't in there as well, I'd be very surprised, you know. Yeah. So, like, I mean, um, go on. Sorry, Paul. No, I'm just, yeah. in a way, I'm actually glad it came this early because the other thing I was thinking was they were holding out to get the hate speech laws through beforehand. And then, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. what, we'd be arrested for going around trying to talk about immigration, you know what I mean? Well, I tell you, the problem is that they're going to try to get them in immediately after the election. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. they had the early yeah. election, I, but, I think, you know. Was... But at least now the, the genie's out of the bottle a little bit. Like, we're actually having a conversation and people are meeting people and they're, they're coming back to us with it. Going back to what we're talking about on the doorsteps, like mm-hmm. you meet someone and they'll be talking about, uh, say, they're looking for a CARES allowance or something, and they're not, not getting it or they're only getting half of entitlement. And then you was talking to them and, you know, having a chat with them, and then they'll bring it up. They'll be like, I can't see why I can't get it when we've all this money for, for these people coming in and all exactly. that. And, yeah. And like, I'm not even bringing it up. They're bringing it up. And that, people, um, that's people really going on. They're not blind. So we need to have we need to be allowed to have the conversation, and people shouldn't be afraid to have the conversation. And thankfully, as it stands, we, can, we we're, it's not illegal yet, so we're gonna we're gonna keep talking. Well, lads, even if it is illegal, like I don't think I'm going to be stopping my changing my opinions or hiding under a bushel. No. Like, I mean, at the end no. of the day, like, uh, what, are they going to lock us up? Are yeah. they really? You know what I mean? Like, no, not for these conversations. I wouldn't think it'd be more like if you're victimizing some, some individual. Probably, probably. I'm not sure though, but, but I don't. I, I, I agree with Paul. It's glad, glad to have it early. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, let, let's let's look at it this way. I mean, in the last so many years, the people talking about these issues, the two major ones were uh, Kevin Myers and John Waters, as regards the. Um, the father's rights thing and all that end of it. And then Kevin Myers would talk a good bit about uh, immigrate, migration uh, into Ireland. That kind of thing. And he was talking about it 10, 15 years ago. I remember reading him. Uh, what I, I can't remember which it was at the Times or the Independent he was in, but I remember reading him. Yeah. He was talking about, we need to have this debate now. And that's yeah. that long ago. And then, yeah, like and he, he, he saw it in Leicester, wasn't it? In, in Britain, he was in. Yeah. He, he was born in Leicester, I think, wasn't it? I think. But like, I mean, he he was there talking about that so many years ago, and then he was still doing it uh, up until, like, I mean, he got deplatformed because he mentioned that um, a particular group of people were good with money, and uh, right. then um, you know he's gone, and then uh, John Waters was gone before that. You know, what I mean, he was like, mm-hmm. you go on to any of the national uh, uh, airwaves. Or uh, even Shannon side, I didn't get a chance to mention it, but like, you know, he came out with a book there last year, never mind the bad roads, and no, uh, no mainstream media, uh, nobody, you know, usually like, I mean, if you come out with a book, they'll all be clamoring, oh, get that person on, give them half an hour, plug the book, all the rest of it. He didn't get anything. And then uh, he got deplatformed, and then George Hook uh, just said, I mean, all he said was like, I mean, a particular young lady was in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's all he said. Mm-hmm. But she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he gets and be the responsible. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, these things are, are basically operations. Like, you can see how they... Like, that was a prime example because there was no reason uh, to really... Like, he, that was nothing wrong with that. That is an opinion. Like, and, mm-hmm. and, like, 
there's nothing wrong with that and he nothing he said was in any way hateful whatsoever uh, this is a like they pile on in this cynical way like it's 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 planned out like you know what i mean all these articles are all of a sudden all these duplicate articles are printed in all these papers and all these guys are pretending to be offended you know it's just it's, it's just cynical the whole thing it's, you know? it's happening in other countries as well I, I seen there just before christmas there was a famous commentator on ice hockey in canada that was fired because he said that um some of the he said that immigrants that he's known to say controversial things sometimes but he said some of the immigrants wouldn't kneel down or they wouldn't wear the poppy before the national yeah, anthem wear, or something yeah, like that wear the memorial uh, and he was fired for, uh, the uh, memorial day i think that was it that was but it he, yeah put it that way he put it he, he put it very milk toast he didn't you know yeah. he just, uh, he did. I don't know. It was just so, um, you know, you know, so you mildly, like it was uh, offending anyone. You know, no, uh, and that's yeah, we, and we seem to be copying that. You know, and, and then, the, then most... see, the, the other thing about it is as well is that the the, the, um, the uh, broadcasters that are there now. I mean, what this what this has done with them is everybody is afraid to broach subjects now. You know, like even I was listening to James Reynolds there today on the uh, uh, on the Shannon side show earlier on today, and it came up a few times about immigration, and again, the whole thing about what's Irish came up, you know? And um, the, the lady doing the, um, the debate, anyway, she mentioned that, she said to him, um, you know, like, I mean, oh, uh, is a child born in Ireland to two immigrant parents, is that child Irish? Well, officially, that child isn't Irish because we had a referendum back in 2004 that states that uh, uh, two foreign parents, their child, is, uh, Irish citizenship is not given to that child. That's what the referendum in 2004 was about. Yeah. So, like, you know, and, and all the broadcasters, the only one that kind of, like, I mean, he goes up to the cliff edge is boiling. And Nile boiling, he'll go yeah. up that far, and then you know, he'll look over and he'll go, I'm not going over there. Yeah, yeah, you know? That's what it, it all becomes about you know, Canadian Australian model passport, this kind of stuff. Like, it's but, just about yeah. economy, you know, like, and he can't, but, he can't look at it from the real way, like, and yeah, that's the know, crucial you know, thing. Yeah, uh, he'll come the line, like, I mean, uh, well, what, what does Irish mean? What does Irish mean? And like, you know, like, right. yeah, and, well, and you yeah, have met a few like, years ago, anyway, you know, well, if two people. Ask that of a Japanese person or a, a Russian person, or a, no, you wouldn't. You know, I mean, it, ju it just seems like, or a Chinese person, even, you know. I mean, and if two immigrants can home here, come here and have a child, and the child is Irish, well, then Irish means nothing, really. Yeah, that, yeah. it means nothing if that's if they can do that. If, if that's one, why that's why we stopped that in the citizenship one, referendum. If one parent has Irish citizenship, that confers Irish citizenship on that child. Hmm. Them's yeah. the rules, baby, you know. Yeah. And that was the rules for years and years and years. Like you, you had to have a child, and that, yeah, and and or if you were married to someone, um, or and the, the one of the parents was Irish, then the then then the child would be Irish. But we, yeah, the, the referendum stopped that people could come in and just have a child, and the child would be Irish just because the child was born here. If if people could do that, that's exactly what we're fighting against: is that process because that is that means Irish means nothing if people can just arrive here and have a child mm. that's Irish. And they're trying to gradually bring that back in without without going to another referendum and just trying to um, they'll bring up all these cases like some child in a school and all the schools getting behind yeah. it to naturalize the child even though he, the, the law says no he shouldn't be so we're not really radical at all when you think of it lads the national party radical. i mean aren't you really want you really want to impose the laws that are actually there that aren't exactly. been that have been ignored exactly. that's the thing the, the like, laws that the irish people voted on the laws that the irish people uh put in place themselves yes. through the government mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the governments that are trying to subvert them now. Yeah. But you look yeah. at it, like, even the fact that we are here, like, we're talking about, you know, what, what is Irish. Like, when you think about it, like, that's, uh, it's, it's completely wrong to have to justify what is Irish. Like, yeah. who are these people to make us jump through some bloody hoop to justify our existence? Like, you, you, you meet an Irish person in the street, that's an Irish person. I don't have to go through a checkbox. I, I know yeah. when I meet someone from another country and they have oh. an Irish passport, I know that person is not Irish. And that exactly. is not offensive. Yeah. We don't have to get every person who comes here to work a passport. They don't have to have one. They can be just a guest worker. You know, sorry, go ahead, Paul. I know, I was going to say, I mean, you know, uh, just as a, a silly example, like, I mean, Irish to me is when you're abroad and you see the lad in the, 
in the uh, O'Neill's shorts with the stripes <laughs> down the side and the pasty that's white Irish. legs and a pair of and a pair of sandals with socks on. Yeah, there you go. That's that's my definition. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This, this thing, we have to justify ourselves. But, you know, it's it's pandering. It's pathetic. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. You know. Like I agree with, with what you're saying down there. Like um, the very fact that you have to ask that question, there's something very, very wrong there. Like what is what yeah. is Irish? Like you have to ask that question of you. Um, I I think the the real question should be um, when is Ireland not Irish anymore? That's the real question. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. Like when I was in when I was in school, um, you know, 25, 30 years ago in primary school and whatever, and even in secondary school, um, there was always maybe one or two. Uh, foreign kids in the school, you know, maybe not every every class would happen, but every between two years there'd be a foreign kid or you know what I mean, like something like that. So you might have 50 to 60 to one foreign uh, children in the school and and they just they might have foreign parents but they'd um, do everything we're doing and hang out with us and they'd just be raised as Irish, you know. Maybe they wouldn't stand up for the prayers or something like that in school, but we didn't we just carried on. They were Irish, they were immersed in Irishness. You know what I mean? But yeah, now you've got large numbers. Yeah. Now you've got a situation like the schools are not too far from here, actually. And uh, the, the numbers are reversed. It's like 50 or 60 foreign kids to the one Irish. And like, how is, how is anyone in that school going to go up to the Irish? They're not. They're not really. You see, that's it. They're, that's they're, it. They're, so, they're like, got an identity because of that, you know, and, and you see there's these problems. Uh, in a lot of these inner city communities or whatever, these diverse communities, you see this loss of identity and it's replaced by a superficial identity. And often in a place like London, for example, they have this, well, actually they have it in Dublin as well. Now what am I saying? They have this drill rap and all this kind of stuff, you know, and it's just this kind of, uh, it's just like bastardized kind of hip hop uh, culture that's kind of imported from America. And they all kind of take this on as a kind of a culture and they all kind of talk like from London in it, you know. And you see lads in Dublin now doing this, like in, I'm from, you know, Dublin in it, you know, they do this kind of, because they haven't got a real culture. They've been taken from their own real traditional culture, dumped into a, a basically nothing more than an economy, an economic territory. That's all it is. And they've been bastardized and they've been given a fake identity. And and it's incredibly destructive. And it's destructive to us. It's destructive to them. Everyone loses, you know? Yeah. And since we can see that there are schools like that, that should be like that school in Longford, the one that uh, Gemma got in huge trouble for bringing up the photograph. That should be a warning to people all over Ireland that if we don't uh, wake up and, and realize this and actually look look at political parties who will address this, um, well, then all of the schools in Ireland will eventually end up like that by Project Ireland 2040, by 2040, because of, because of the plans that the government are trying to implement here, which is to bring in uh, loads and loads of people, which really is part of the UN Migration Compact that we protested, which is to make migration a human right, as long as it's not Europeans or South Africans, anyone else, of course, it's a human right to just walk in. Yeah, we well, need someone to highlight that. Ryan out of the Green Party, you know, like, I mean, the, the um, you know, the environmentally friendly party, all the rest of it, that's like, you know, we're supposed to look after our uh, resources and our countryside and they said, you know, he was quoted as saying, like, I mean, uh, there could be 10 million people on this island. 10 million. We can't, ma we can't manage what's on it. Yeah, that's radical. That 10 and million. Going that, that 10 million. Well, I'm, I'm saying this. Sorry. You know, there's some idea that, like, I mean, oh, there's going to be some environmentally friendly um, uh, technology that, like, uh, will build skyscrapers and, you know, like, I mean, we'll, we'll all be uh, living in cubes and something, like, I mean, and, you know. If Eat they want a million people on this uh, island, they're going to have to go nuclear, right? Of course, yeah. They're going to have to go nuclear. That's it, plain and simple. You know, there's no other technology. They can stick up as many windmills as they want. I mean, and plain and simple, what the windmills, by all accounts, are doing, they're killing all the birds. Yeah. And Kevin, yeah, we don't go nuclear. Years ago, they don't want well. fossil fuels, and they don't want nuclear. And the, the options they have don't produce enough energy. And that's just a fact. Like, they just do not produce enough energy. It's a, Basically, it's a big white elephant operation whereby tax money is funneled into these massive conglomerates mm -hmm. who buy up land, buy wind farms and everything. But um, and there, go ahead. Yeah. There's nothing green about a battery-powered car either. That's just mm -hmm. that's a lie straight away. You know what I mean? I've seen what a lithium mine actually looks like. And uh, it's not. It's no way green or environmentally friendly, I tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to plug it in. But they yeah. want, they want, they want uh, what is it? Is it three cars for every 30 people in the village? Oh, yeah. 
I heard that. Imagine so. the over that. <laughs> yeah. They want, they want a population of 10 million and no cars. And we're yeah. going to take, aren't they going to take, uh, like, was it, what was the plan in 10 years? They're not going to have any cars or something? Was that the, the Any plan? petrol or diesel engines yeah, yeah. whatsoever. I mean, good, I imagine, good running yeah. a farm on, like, I mean, uh, you know, you're back, you're back to the, uh, the Shire horse and the plow, you know? Hard. I mean, yeah. Like, I, 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 to be honest with you, I am actually first more sustainable agriculture. I mean, I do, you know, I mean, I think the farmers, um, you know, you know, because the supermarkets have the market, have, have the thing like cornered off, you know, I mean, and they're dictating all the way down the line. And, um, you know, the, the farmers really need to get a direct line to uh, their customer. You know, and I mean the old butcher. I mean, I know, I know it, it's it sounds old fashioned and impractical, but like I mean, the you know, like I I go to a butcher inside there in Longford a lot of the time now, and great meat, all the rest of it, um, and it, it has like uh, we are it produced. Be done. Yeah, well, it can be done, and we, you know, I mean, and mo most of, let's face it, most of the meat in the country is for export at the end of the day, and the product they have, it's grass fed meat. It is premier. I mean, you're not you're not getting that coming in. And what's happening is they're bringing stuff in from Brazil that's feedlots. It's uh, it's a much inferior product to the product they're making here that they're producing here in Ireland. You know, and those men, those farmers. I was at that a meeting over in Kiltiven the other night, and I was there and I was listening to the other candidates, and they were giving out their policy document and all the rest of it. And I looked around the room and I saw maybe there was three or four lads uh, under 40 years old. And I looked around and I, I just lost it. And I went on a bit of a rant. <laughs> be honest with you. I just totally That's forgot about any national party policy or anything like that. And I went on a rant. And, um, like I, I thought, like, I mean, my father back in the day and he, when he started out with nothing and then he just invested all his money in land and cattle. And he loved that end of things from when he was very young. And uh, now we came later on and, like I was away and, uh, you know, I worked summers on the farm and that kind of thing. And, you know, uh, uh, but not a whole lot. Never pushed myself at it. And like, I mean, I, I, I hands up, you know, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no beef farmer. But like, um, uh, but I know what goes into it. And I know, like, I mean, I know the love of the land that those men have. And to look on their faces and uh, they're frustrated at the moment and, you uh, you know, like, I mean, the beef protests and that, that they were out there and even when they drove the tractors up to Dublin and that, and, um, you know, all they want is a fair share of the pie that they can make a living and, like, I mean, uh, you know, bring up their families. And, and like, I mean, let's, you know, the reinvestment that has to go into farms, you know, lads will be talking about, oh, look at them there and the big tractors and all the rest of it. If you don't have the latest... You don't have to have the latest, but I mean, if you don't upgrade your tractor every couple of years and that kind of thing, like, I mean, they're more fuel efficient. The, you know, like, I mean, you know, they're talking about CO2 emissions and that the diesel engines that are out now are way more efficient than, like, I mean, what they had even five years ago, you know? I mean... Uh, Would they you know, say that to a factory owner? Oh, why are you upgrading your equipment? Well, obviously, you're upgrading your equipment because you want to stay competitive. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah well, and, and then there was the whole thing of uh, Harvest 2010 or 2020. Everybody kind of forgets about this. So that was uh, brought uh, along, uh, I guess it was Fianna Foyle were in government back in 2010 and Department of Agriculture were promoting, like, I mean, expanding uh, the beef herd, expanding uh, uh, milk, uh, all this kind of thing. And uh, a lot of farmers reinvested in uh, more buildings, more land, all that kind of thing. And uh, Bang, come 2020, cutting the beef herd in half, guys. You have to get rid of those cattle. Yep. You know? There's always these things in agriculture. There's, there's so many scams out there. They always get the young lads in. And right now yeah. that, what they have is they have all the young farmers now paying the rent for the older ones. And they're all going around. They're basically working for nothing. Like You know what I mean? Tr trying to get land. Because they can't afford to get land. There's no money in anything. There's no profit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The beef the industry's one, gone. Did, yeah. right? The other one that they did as well as regards forestry. Now, I'm in forestry at the moment. And back when I... When my father started out in that, you actually had to be a farmer mm. to uh, get the premium and that kind of thing to convert your land to forestry. And they did away with that. So I can't remember when. And that's when, like, um, uh, that's when the pension funds and 
a lot of different uh, companies came in and started investing in forestry. And this is what happened in uh, Leitrim, where there's a lot of companies have bought land in Leitrim and uh, planted it, and they've no connection to the area whatsoever. And Paul knows about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Same. And uh, yeah, and they're competing with, say, uh, a farm comes up for sale next door to a, a farmer that's already got a holding and he wants to expand his farm. Then, lo and behold, a company from somewhere else or a, a bigger farmer from down the country with another thing that's happening. They're coming up and buying the land, planting trees on it, and using it as a carbon offset for, for their own yeah. uh, for their own farm. So I've heard there's actually people uh, investing, uh, and Leitrim is where this is happening in a big way. I've heard that, and there's um like there's there's a, people from Dublin and places who people aren't even farmers at all actually are yeah. like buying up massive amounts of land in places like Leitrim, like and just putting like alder and uh, and maybe eucalyptus. Oh, yeah, I can't remember some other species, maybe spruce. Yeah. I don't know. This is what. Sitka. Like Sitka, yeah, the, yeah. Far, the farmers in the local area that, like, I mean, you know, would farm that land. They're put out of the market altogether because these mm. companies they can they can afford the extra fifteen hundred two thousand euro per acre. That yeah. you know, a, far, a farmer when he goes to buy land, he's got a figure in his head. You know, when he goes yeah. to an auction and like that, he has a figure in his head and he says, "I can't go any further than that." You know, because he knows what he can make out of that land per year. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and I think. That, He's out of the market. Yeah, and these people that are dictating these things, they don't really have a clue themselves. They're only getting uh, advice from other people that we don't actually know that aren't elected. Because I remember Eamon Ryan, it was said today that he had, he, there's a quote from him back in 2008 or nine saying that everybody should invest in diesel cars. And when he was, when this was said to him, yeah, you're saying that back then, but now you're saying that these have to be taken off the road. Well, he said, oh, well, it was just advice I got from um, such a department at the time. So that's why I said that. So it just proves like that these people that are actually trying to enforce this, even like Hazel Chu, whoever, any of these greens, it's it, they don't know any of the stuff themselves. They they don't investigate it themselves. It's just stuff that they're told. It's above their pay grade. I think they're just there to enforce the policy. Um, and it's the same with Project Ireland twenty forty and all of those things. A lot of it goes above the national government. Even the Green Party, like when it comes to the environment, like they actually don't know anything about agriculture. They don't know anything about no. about. They take the Australia wildfires. It's a prime example of like idiot Greens uh, mandating that they can't do burns. They, they don't they don't allow people to do burn offs anymore. So essentially, all this scrub builds up and then mm -hmm. it gets ignited. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. uh, it's and it happens all the time. Like like forest fires are there are certain species of tree whose uh, whose whose seeds don't actually germinate unless they're burned and they, they have to go through that process all the time. So it's this whole idea because like ultimately the greens are kind of a cult and it's it's basically a kind of a death cult you know they they don't actually most of these lads don't farm don't know anything about how to, they couldn't grow a vegetable and they don't know anything about the soil and they think that animals are bad they think that having cattle is bad you know whereas cattle are part of the whole ecosystem like this is all part of what feeds the feeds the it's all a cycle yeah, you know exactly and whatever happens in Ireland it's not going to matter a jot. Yeah. If China and India and these other countries don't get their uh, yeah. uh, don't get their house in order, it's not going to matter. Goddamn, um, you know. yeah, yeah, we're only making life miserable for ourselves for no reason. If they're yeah. not going, if they're not going to address it, but I just want to say. Uh, Paul McWheeney and Paul Hanley, thanks very much for coming on. Paul McWheeney is in the Sligo Leitrim constituency for the National Party, and Paul Hanley is in the Roscommon Galway constituency for the National Party. And Don, thanks very much for coming on as well for this chat. Yeah, I think great. we covered a lot. Oh, we did. I think we got a lot done. And I mean, you see, win, lose, or draw in this election, like, uh, you know, and if the hate speech stuff comes in, whatever, like, I mean, the the name is out there now. And uh, for, for, for all the nationalist uh, parties, you know, and um, look, I mean, and as I say, like, I mean, the debate is going to happen online. It's going to happen in pubs. It's going to happen wherever, you know, you, you know, it, you can't stop it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to happen. They can try and stop it, but it'll happen. Even if we have to go onto some other website somewhere else, but it will happen. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it's a great thing that you are running, and thank God for it. And it's raising the consciousness and the idea of the National Party. People will recognize and realize that there is somebody out there actually fighting for the rights of the Irish people. And that's brilliant. So, um, yeah, I'll end it now, lads. Thanks to you as all. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, Thanks very much. Yeah. Take care, guys. Best and of luck. Stop taking down them posters, whoever's doing that out there. <laughs> right. Good night, everybody. Thanks, guys.